This conference will now be recorded. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm happy to see Mark was available to do this amazing talk on the blended wing body design. And it's been a pretty hot topic, I think, for the last, last year, especially at KWF, um, given the fact that this is the design we've uh, selected for our Snow Leopard Himalaya uh, project. So I'm, I'm pretty excited and I'm excited to have Mark here today who's been amazing advisor to KWF for Mark maybe now almost a decade because I think we first got I know. started when <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were like in South Africa. We were working in South Africa back then and That's right. that was a pretty much a decade ago. Wow. So I'm glad that you're still with us and excited that we're able to take one of your very unique designs and use it for a good cause. So thank you so much for being here and helping us understand what blended wing body is. And then it's essentially, how can we improve the Eagle Ray design that we've been working on for a while? So I'm gonna hand over the reins to you. I will stop sharing my screen and make you the presenter. Very good. Well, welcome everybody. I see a couple names on there that I recognize, uh, I, I get to live in a couple fraternities and one of them is uh, the Electric EV Tall Fraternity. And <clears throat> let's see, entire screen, entire screen, share, share, choose which one to share, entire screen. Oh, there it is, I see share. Let me do that for starters. Um, for some of you who, who don't know much about myself and so forth uh, one of the great projects that uh, can you see this on the screen are you seeing the uh the yeah. uh, uh beta, so the beta alia um uh is one of the airplanes out there that we're working on i had the pleasure of being asked to design it for beta in in uh, uh vermont it's been very it's been a fabulous experience they have tons of students working with them and interns a great place i just can't say enough about it I see some other folks here that are working on everything from, you know, from from Archer to Jovia, all over the place. Um, lots of cool stuff happening there, and some of it is relevant for what you guys are going to be working on with the high altitude UAV uh, reconnaissance, trying to find these very rare animals and find anybody who is where they're not supposed to be. <laughs> so, with that, what I thought I'd do, I thought I'd actually jump in. And, and go back in time. We were talking a moment ago, and Aliyah just confirmed that you see, you're seeing the screen with uh, suitability. I hope. If anyone is not seeing, do you guys see the BWB suitability as UAV? Yes, no? Uh, yeah, we see it. Yes, we see okay, it. Okay, great. Yeah, we see it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So 2014. Thank you so much. So 2014 was one of the times that I got to meet with um, with with Ron and Princess Alia, and we were in DC and uh, had a discussion with all kinds of interesting folks who were doing other airplane projects about, hey, what 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 kind of platforms would be suitable as UAVs? This is ancient history, guys. This is kind of where some of the discussion started. Uh, the stuff we're going to see here, uh, it, it has lots of um, antecedents and, and so forth, it's all unclassified, it's open material. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, the, the kind of stuff that we do at my company, um, believe it or not, we, we've done a lot of race cars in our prior lives, and we've done uh, blend wing UAVs, uh, we've done the Eclipse Concept Jet, the Mooney M10, and now the Beta Alia, among other things, as well as just a lot of UAVs. Now it's 12 UAVs total that we've done. Um, that are in service around the world, and so it's a fun it's a it's a fun job. Many of you are in that kind of work, or many of you will become work, workers in that area. Uh, the opportunities are tremendous, as you know, because uh, unmanned aircraft of all types and unmanned ground robots and sailing vessels and subs have so many uses, especially in conservation and understanding climate change and all the things that have a bearing on the habitat for uh, endangered animals. So there's habitat questions, and there's also, of course, uh, uh, you know, trying to interdict people who are doing harm to these animals directly. Um, at our vehicle design studio in Irvine, we designed lots of crazy airplanes. 
we get asked all the time to look at uh, uh, nutty things and not so nutty things, um, uh, different kinds of VTOL, different kinds of uh, uh, airplane arrangements. Lots of airplanes have to fold up to be stored or moved, vertical takeoff and landing. And we do all kinds of stuff in that capacity. So we get to play in the desert, fly a lot of stuff, try a lot of stuff. But when you think about the blended wing, the story for me started actually in 1992. But there was a famous conference in 1988 hosted by NASA with the question was posed by the chief scientist at NASA, hey, could there be an aero re renaissance for long haul transports? How come 1903 to 1947, all the changes happened and 1947 to 1992, nothing happened? <laughs> Stepped wings, cylindrical pressure vessel, uh, uh, nacelles on pylons. Um, is there nothing, is that it? Are we done? Have we found the optimum or is there anything more? And at that time, uh, we started doing some work and we went back to first principles to answer the question, what could you do that's different than a tube and wing? And so this is a model I came up with to uh, discuss philosophically how we approach the problem to begin with. And that is, hey, I need to carry so many people, which takes up so much volume. I could do two things. I can make a cigar, or actually I can make a Frisbee. And usually most people say, I think the cigar might be a better way to go. And it starts out about the same as the Frisbee in terms of the surface area it takes to wrap it. Turns out a Frisbee is closer to a sphere than a cigar. So it has a little advantage. So there's some indication here that, hmm, maybe the cylinder, very easy to build, very easy to take pressure loads is a great way to go. But let's see what happens. If I merge those things with a wing of a given span, whoa, I hide a bunch of the wing area that was exposed. I've got the same fuselage area that I had before. So I realize a gain before I do anything else. Structurally, of course, that little wing now, I could actually slide the wing further out and make it, uh, you know, keep it just as slender as today's wings and get a span increase as well. But getting a wetted area reduction is very significant. And then if I look at engine integration, control surfaces and so forth, there's potential to do even more in terms of savings. And it's not a given that you're gonna get a reduction just because you draw it like this, <laughs> not at all. The reason you get a reduction fundamentally in the tail surfaces in particular is because with a very short payload compartment, the center of gravity variation is very, very short. It's a third to a half as much. So the amount of pitch control and stability you need to be provided by the tails is considerably less because you don't have to uh, uh, it, it have those uh, functionalities across such a wide center of gravity range. And then all of a sudden, hey, I could ask my wings to do that job for me and they can if you do it right. The other thing that happens is this, if I look at a tube and wing on the left compared to a blender wing on the right, um, if I distribute the payload across a couple of decks in this case, across the wingspan, then the red, which is the mass, uh, the big spikes of the fuel, uh, and the blue is the aerodynamic lift, what happens is the arrows are more aligned with each other. The lift and the weight are happening closer to each other. Whereas with the tube and wing, the weight's all concentrated in the middle, the lift's across the span. What that means is that the shear and bending stresses are gonna accumulate from the wing tip going inboard on the tube and wing to a far greater extent than on the blended wing. So we get a span loading benefit, we get a reduced wetted area benefit, and we're starting to see, okay, this is interesting. There's a lot of work yet to do, but this is interesting. Uh, and then for a transonic airplane, this is all the ancient stuff we did, did back in the 90s, early 90s. But for a transonic airplane, I have this quandary, which is, well, my Frisbee wants to be fat, but wings are normally thin, and wings are normally thin and swept, so I can fly at 0.8 or 0.85 Mach number and not have... Uh, 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 shock and do stall on the wing. I don't want to have drag divergence from the wave drag growing too much. But with the airplane, we realized that, hey, in the middle where I need it thick, I don't need to carry much lift per unit length because it's so long. And what I really want in the end is that blue distribution with the arrows, something that's sort of like an ellipse, a little bit triangular, sort of like a Prandtl um, distribution. Uh, that's going to be the minimum arrow structural loading. And then when I look at it and ask, well, hey, the cord I'm showing in red, or I think I, sorry, I'm showing the thickness to cord ratio in red, and I'm showing the lift required in yellow, and the lift required is just that blue curve divided by the cord across the span. And it says, wow, 
where the airplane has to be thick, I'm not going to ask it to lift much. That's wonderful because then I can make a transonic wing, do everything it needs to do just fine because either I ask it to do a lot of lift and it's thin so I can stay under drag divergence or I can be thicker, but I don't ask it to do much lifting. That keeps me under drag divergence. So this is why we were very interested for this class of airplane and what a blender wing could do. And we went out, we did a bunch of wind tunnel tests at the National Transonic Facility at the low speed uh, 12, uh, 14 by 22 at NASA Langley. And we're uh, very happy to see that the correlation was quite good in terms of the predicted drag, the predicted CL max. Um, here, this early airplane, actually, if you look down here on the right, you'll see it's pitching moment and gall dang it. Actually, this is stable, 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 stable. And it's showing that this one back then, it actually was pitching up. So it had an unstable break at stall. That we got that fixed later on. But at the time, we had some work to do. This is when I left McDonnell Douglas in 1997. This is where the airplane was. We had a double deck airplane, but only people were on the upper deck and cargo on the lower deck. And they shared that space with the landing gear. And it was a multi-bay design, each bay with five abreast seating. This is a 450 passenger airplane that was the focal point for a lot of work with uh, NASA. At the time, there was a team at McDonnell Douglas just before the merger with Boeing, feverishly working to make this airplane a product. This would have been circa 1996 through 1999, and uh, sorry, 1990, late 1997. So it was about a year and a half, and uh, there was every effort made to see if this could become a product. Unbeknownst to all of us, negotiations were going on in the background for a merger between Boeing and McDonnell Douglas. But at the time, gambling that McDonnell Douglas had to make a move to stay in the commercial aircraft industry because they hadn't done a new airplane uh, since the merger with McDonnell. The DC-10 was the last new airplane they did. The MD-11 was a derivative. MD-90 was a derivative of a DC-9. They built, designed built the C-17, but commercially, McDonnell Douglas hadn't made a new airplane since it became McDonnell Douglas. Um, and not for lack of trying, it's simply that at the time the board would not approve uh, the, uh, jumping into that market space. It was more risky than military. But we also did a lot of comparing to the A380, which was in process, and the airplane looked pretty darn good. Um, uh, my, my colleagues who, who made this presentation for at Boeing at the time, um, I like this a, a greener than a green giant. <laughs> But in any case, it was very promising, 19% less empty weight, 18% uh, less takeoff weight, uh, fuel burn per seat was 32% less. That was with common engines and otherwise common technology. And while I was on an airplane one day, I finally figured out how we could stretch a blended wing. It wasn't at all obvious how you take it with a cylinder as a fuselage, I can cut it put a little plug in, a little ring and stretch it, it's pretty easy. It's easy to see how that works. Um, it's not so easy when the air, whole airplane's a wing. Uh, the, what occurred to me, and I'll show you more on this, don't worry about it right now, but I'll show you more on this, was that you cut it down the center line. That's the trick with some constraints and you could grow it. But when we merged with Boeing, it quickly became clear that Boeing was not interested in advancing the blended wing. They did continue to work with NASA for a long time, but it never appeared on the product strategy. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go do blended wing wherever the heck I can. I ended up working at a race car company <laughs> called Swift Engineering, where I helped them get into unmanned aircraft. And I said, let's try a blended wing UAV. And our first concept was this, Killer B is gonna be a three piece airplane. And God darn it, we did. We built the three, B, three piece airplane with a little bit of a cheat. The idea was that there was going to be an upper skin with a live hinge. So this part would have would be molded with a little strip of Kevlar that had some elastomeric material in it. And then here, and we just go, cut a slot there, cut a slot there, cut a slot there, cut a slot there. And now that's an elevon. We had inboard elevons so we could have inboard servos. Why? So they could all live underneath an access cover. The fuel tank, the payload, the engine, the servos would all live, live under one cover. And the fuel tank, in fact, we'd have the bottom half would have this proud surface that when bonded to the upper skin would create a volume that was a fuel tank. So it was a three-piece airplane. And that's how it was going to look. And we built it. <laughs> we built that three-piece airplane. 
and we went and flew it and it, it was a champ. It was really a hoot to fly that thing. That was our first killer bee. It was actually quite successful. We went tunnel test it. So here's my cheat guys. Okay, yes, we did have, we did glue on little winglet tips. Yeah, okay, guilty as charged. But otherwise, it was truly a three-piece airplane that gave us access to everything. It was super, super simple. But the other thing that has to be said was it didn't fly that great. The pitch controls in the middle mean I'm dumping a lot of lift to make pitching moments. So in the end, we did end, uh, add some control surfaces outboard. Later, we started evolving the airplane into something that could really get, get some work done. This is not a transonic airplane. It's a low-speed airplane flying 60 to 100 knots. <clears throat> this class of airplane with gas engines was doing 15 to 24 hours of endurance and carrying tens of pounds of payload. We wind tunnel tested this version. This was called Killer B4 in our wind tunnel at Swift, where we were also developing race cars. I want to point out something, though. For some of you who might not be aware of this principle, um, if you look carefully, you'll see here there's a spoiler sticking out on the bottom. It has a bit of an unusual shape because we had it, it, it could otherwise interfere with um, part of the airframe that we had sticking out. But basically, it's just a spoiler on the bottom of the airplane, and it's mounted very close to the center of gravity underneath. When we deflected that little thing 90 degrees, and it was perforated, not because we knew any better, but because we thought it, we should perforate it so it wouldn't buff it. When we deflected that to our shock, we increased our CL max by 25%. That little thing increased our maximum trimmed lift coefficient by 25%. Um, and I later had a PhD student at USC, Jan Stellens, published a number of reports where we studied this further. But we actually flew it on the KB4. In fact, we flew it. <laughs> We were doing a test in the desert, our first test to try it out. We didn't put it on to make more CO max. We put it on as a drag brake. We had the pilot deploy it. Now we had to fly looking through a camera beamed down to a display. He was to fly it into a net that he could barely see through this darn camera. And he got nervous and he said, I don't like the extra drag. We thought it would be good. We thought it would help him with uh, stabilize the uh, uh, fugoid. But in the end, he didn't like it, so he retracted the flap. The next thing we know, none of us see outside can see the airplane. It has it has plunged 75 feet instantly when he retracted the flap, hit the runway, bounced off, collected up in the wingtips, collected up sagebrush pieces in the wingtip hooks, <laughs> and scuffed the nose. But these protected the prop, and it got airborne again. And we didn't even know it hit the ground. No one knew what happened except why is it now carrying sagebrush in the wingtips? Uh, this is the the airplane at that time it had a pneumatic catapult launcher and it was net recovered that was the fad everybody wanted to be runway independent and now of course we're doing that with vtol which with electrics is becoming really practical back then it just wasn't and i wanted to show you this because i want all of you to think about the utility of the thing you're making because we're making an airplane but it's in the service of its job to find bad guys, also to hopefully track, count, and monitor the, the lifestyle of the, of the subject animals that we're trying to protect. Um, and for that, it may need a lot of different types of payloads. So here's the center body of the Killer B4 uh, with the wings off. I want to show you some things. So I, my guys came back and said, Mark, we know blender wings are awesome and they're strong and stiff because the structure is so deep. Can we cut holes in the top and the bottom? <laughs> Can we actually cut the entire top and bottom off? <laughs> and I protested. But in the end, utility was so powerfully beneficial if I could take the top and the bottom off that we did. And we never looked back. The fuel tank's there in the middle. Why is the fuel tank in the middle? It ought to be in the middle. <laughs> That's where the center of gravity is. When you burn the fuel off the airplane, you like to keep the fuel close by the CG. But let me show you some of the other pieces. I'm taking the pieces apart. I've taken the outer skin off. You can see the front spar and the rear spar. You can see the rails that support this tank. There's other rails that we had here supporting, in this case, two turrets that we were going to use. This is the interface control panel to test everything on the ground before you launch. 
<clears throat> this is the vehicle management box, the GPS, and the and the autopilot power management systems. Back here's the propulsor. Here's the engine, cooling inlets and exhaust, the propeller and extension shaft. There's that vehicle management box. There's a fuel tank. Here you can see that we use the unused space behind the rear spar for silencers. So these are mufflers that have a double backflow path. So the exhaust comes in here, comes all the way back, and goes out the top of the airplane here. And it proved to be a very quiet installation, which is also something we care about. Now, we're not going to be gas-powered. We'll be electric. That's awesome. We still have to be very cognizant of noise. The quieter we can make the airplane, the better. And the, the first step to make it be, making the airplanes quiet is keep the tip Mach number of your prop below 0.4. If you keep it down to 0.3 or 0.2, wow, it'll be quiet. But if you're at 0.4, you're probably doing pretty darn good. But let me show you something here with this airplane. Here's the front spar. See those holes? The front spar was mounted with all these nut plates up and down so that we could change our idea on where we put mounting rails. So this mounting rail mounted to the back to nut plates here and nut plates here, and we could take it out make a wider tank and have it on rails that went here to here. So I mentioned this just again for everyone to think about when you design this airplane, how can we make it as useful to the end user as possible, accessible and flexible so they can change their idea about things later on. Some things ought to probably stay put. Vehicle, In this case, the vehicle management box, some of the heavy stuff was nice to have in the front for balance. Uh, there's other benefits too. This stuff was nice to have in the back because it was hot and stinky and messy. <laughs> that was good. Uh, you can also see here that the wingtips, oh, wait a minute, our wingtips came off. And we had these little pucks in here that were frangible in case something broke. So the airframe wouldn't break if I had a hard landing and the wing wouldn't break. There'd be a little replaceable puck here on the top and the bottom. Here you can see we had a blind mate. We mate the outer wing on. It would plug right into that multi-hole connector. These are all things just to make it more useful. Uh, more idiot proof and flexible for people who aren't idiots. <laughs> um, while that was happening with me and Northrop and Raytheon and others who were using the airplane, NASA and my colleagues kept going on the X-48. So this is a 21 foot span demonstrator airplane. I uh, had three uh, uh, gas powered engines, uh, ducted fans. It was tested here in the third of a 60 tunnel. It was free tether tested. Uh, it, then it was flight tested out in the desert. So here you're looking down at, uh, uh, this is actually uh, Edwards Dry Lake Bed. You're looking at the lake bed underneath here, and they're getting ready for a flight test. An amazing, pro one of the most successful X-Plane programs ever. It accumulated more flight hours than any X-Plane ever. A very successful program. They looked at flight controls at low speed. It was never a high-speed airplane. But they took it to deep stall. They took it, uh, understood uh, spin and tumble recovery. Uh, did a lot of really great work, and it was flown uh, from a ground station uh, where a pilot flew it uh, looking through a camera mounted in the airplane. Did a ton of work, then they made a version that had twin fins to shield the exhaust noise for an exceedingly quiet variant of the airplane. That was the C model. You can see that there. You can see how well those, the beaver tail itself, the, the, this part here, we often call the beaver tail of the airplane. And here these fins were used for acoustic uh, containment of the exhaust noise. Okay, so that was the talk I gave way back in 2014. With some pictures of the cool, cool other things I had the honor to work with. But let me show you this. The next thing, this is in 2018 and, I, and Aliyah, I'm trying to remember if I showed some of your guys this presentation. I think I might have, but I'm not totally sure. But I'll show it again. I'll keep it quick. So, at design, uh, we had done the we had done the Killer Bee and the Bat with Northrop, and I was working at Swift. Then me and one of my colleagues, the co-designer of the airplane, created our own company called Design, and the intent there was to keep doing prototyping, which at the time uh, Swift had decided not to do. So we kept going. They since have come back in, and they're a great company, great guys working there too. And our vision, though, was not just to do UAVs and small aircraft, but to build a path to 
addressed it to really doing the vision of the blended wing since Boeing was not going to advance it commercially. Uh, they were doing research, but not intent, no intention to advance it commercially. So we said, hey, let's get into the market space at the bottom as a biz jet where Boeing and Airbus won't come back with a lethal response. <laughs> and then make a single aisle jetliner replacement once we've got our toehold. That was the thought. So I did want to do this little refresher. What the heck is a blender wing? Why, is, why do people think it's better? What does it do? Well, I showed you one version of the story, which is the Frisbee and the tube. Here's another way of looking at it. So take, here we got a 777. Let's just rearrange this airplane. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to find a way to rearrange the airplane that preserves the interior volume, um, increases wingspan, and reduces wetted area. So if I could hide some of the external surface area somehow, if I could rearrange it so the wings are further out, uh, not too skinny, where they get flutter prone. I can't cheat and just make them longer. Uh, no, I, we're, we've already made them as long as we can without being prone to what's called flutter, a dynamic instability from long, flimsy aero surfaces. So, that, so here's, here's why, one way of looking at it. I'm going to take the airplane, and, and my objective is, hey, aero efficiency lift to drag ratio is proportional to the wingspan divided by the square root of the surface area. So if I want 10% more lift to drag ratio, I need 10% more span at the same surface area or I could have 20% less surface area at the same span. Either one's gonna give me about 10%. If I can do both, I can do even better. So let's cut the airplane apart. Let's take the nose off and park it here. Let's take one part of the fuselage and the other part, and part let's park the two pieces of the fuselage on either side. You can see I'm starting to build my Frisbee. And when you think about it, what's gonna happen here is since that fuselage is looking more spherical than cylindrical, I'm already starting to hide wetted area. The sides of each of those fuselage pieces, when I fuse this all together, I throw that away. That's wetted area that's gone. That's structural weight that's gone. I bolt the wings on. Hey, wait a minute. I'm bolting the wings on two fuselage diameters further out. And the wing's no skinnier, and it's mounted to this very large, deep, stiff structure, so it's legal. Then I'm going to take the tails and nacelles and rearrange them on the back get more span and less wetted area, and well, not, I get 30% better lift to drag ratio. That's all a blended wing is, except for all the fussy details. <laughs> so as you know, uh, Boeing, uh, NASA, uh, Airbus, uh, Sagi, a bunch of places started looking at blended wings, thousands of PhDs on blended wings out there. And the interesting thing, the major finding, especially by the Boeing NASA team, which by the way, was, was earnestly trying to convince Boeing to take it seriously um, and was not successful in the end, but they were in it all the way. They were doing their absolute best and they learned a lot and advanced the state of the art immensely. Um, they did, we did, they did wind tunnel tests, they did flight tests. Um, they did structural analysis. They did acoustic radiation analysis. They even built an 85% scale, fully pressurized pressure vessel part, all out of carbon, loaded it as if the wing would load it in bending, pressurized it, tested everything. Then they took a chainsaw and cut holes in it <laughs> and showed that it could sustain what's called a tube crack uh, and just proved that they had invented a type of fail-safe composite structure. Many of you who know about composites, they're special stuff. Metallics are innately fail-safe. Uh, if something cracks, it, usually the crack doesn't propagate because of plastic yield that arrests it. There's a lot of ways to protect yourself. So there's some modes in composites that aren't that elegant. Uh, there's not a lot of way to get ductile redistribution of stress. And so cracks can propagate, delamination can propagate. But this is a process where they stitched the layers together with Kevlar, co-cured the frames and stringers. So the outer skin, the frames here, and the stringer, the longitudinal stringers were all co-cured as a single part. And you could cut through two bays and cut through one of those frames and the structure was 
uh, was fail safe. It's still a redistributed load and could bear the load. Uh, that's a first in composites. That was exciting. So where are the BWBs? Well, <laughs> actually, let me say <clears throat> the lower left thing is important. They found that BWBs were awesome, but they were only feasible above 250 passengers because they needed the double deck to put the landing gear in the right spot. We had to come up with a way to do a single deck. Um, and the industry wants it. They would love to have the blender wing benefits. Um, it's not something that Boeing has chosen to advance. Airbus has flirted with it, but it's doubtful, in my personal opinion, it's doubtful that they actually have a, have a business uh, incentive to do so. Um, so uh, we wanted to look at how we could make this relevant. Uh, if someone could build it, us or someone else, and get it into the marketplace. And we realized we had to do a couple things. First, 75% of all airliners are single aisle jetliners. So we have to make a smaller one that clearly can't be double deck. <laughs> It'd be way too fat. So we wanted to find a way to make a single deck blended wing like this one here, much thinner, smaller, 100, 150, 200 passengers or so. But now we have a problem. If I look at the center of gravity of the airplane, I look where I want to put the main gear. I go straight down, then I go aft a bit. I touch the ground. I hold the airplane up, and I have the wheels behind the center of gravity just enough to prevent tip back a touchdown, but not so far back that I can't pick the nose up for takeoff rotation. So, I, And I do that, of course, by pushing the wing tips here. I push the wing tips down, a tube and wing pushes the tail down, and it can take off. And if the wheels are too far from the center of gravity, then I might have to lift the entire weight of the airplane with a download on the tail equal to the gross weight of the airplane. <laughs> and you can see the problem that happens. Um, if you don't have a long tail arm, the blender wing does not, you could have a challenge. So we found that we had a problem. That's where all the people want to be. That's where the center of gravity wants to be. That's where the wheels want to be. And if I, put the, if I retract the wheels there, I bust up the cabin into a mess. So we said, let's move the wheels where we want to. Let's put them behind the pressure vessel into the trailing edge where I used to have the mufflers on the KB-4. Unused space, no one else wants it, out of the pressure vessel. Oh, that's great. I can retract the air and I can store them. I can hold the airplane up, but I can't rotate. <laughs> so that's not a good, there's a problem. It has to be solved. Well, we posited a solution. We were awarded a utility patent for it. It's called pivot piston. I want to show it to you. There's two things on the airplane I want to point out, though. One I'll point out first. Look at the nacelles. They're kind of blended into the airplane. Um, it's not the first time, in, back in the early, early, early days of jet aircraft, that was very customary, actually. And then there were problems, because when it's close to the airplane, the engines can eat the wake and turbulence from the airplane. And that can be a problem for the combustor and the fan and everything else. So that's not been in favor. And recently, we put engines out in front of the wing where there's no mischief. We put engines under the wing. We put engines far from the fuselage if it's aft mounted. But here, we wanted to get rid of all that wetted area of the bottom of the nacelle, the top of the wing where the, in the shadow of the nacelle, and then the, pilot, the sides of the pylons. We said, wow, we could save a bunch more drag and weight if we can snuggle this in. So we've done that. I'll show you a little bit more about that. We're not eating the boundary layer. We have a boundary layer diverter. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but th that's a key part of this. So the engine doesn't eat muck. It's the same old engine I fly on a 737 MAX, a geared turbofan engine. But the other thing is, look how far back the main gear are. They're crazy far back, crazy far behind. There's no way this airplane could rotate for takeoff unless I do something. Um, and we'll come to how I solve that problem a little bit later. Let me show you, though, if I can make the airplane look like that, look what I could do as a biz jet. Look at the Global 7000. Now there's a new 7500. Look at the G650. Now there's a 700. But nonetheless, here's an airplane with three times the floor space of either of those. And it's not a hallway. It's a home. You could lay it out like you would a home or an apartment. It's a very different space. We've gotten just rave reviews from the billionaires who want to buy these types of things. The airplane's performance is fantastic. We can preserve the same payload, same range, and the same speed. We can't 
it's not easy, frankly, to get all the way up to the 0.925 Mach, but uh, we can get, we can easily do the Mach 0.85, and, but we also get three times the floor space that we had before, and shorter field lengths, which I'll describe later. This is one interior that we laid out, where you can see all the kinds of things you could do now. You could have, you know, entertainment areas, you could have just places you could play games, you could have dining areas, and you could have bedrooms and stand-up showers and bathrooms. You could watch the races in the front. <laughs> uh, here we have side windows, and normally here we'd also have skylights on the uh, commercial. Here in the back part of the cabin, uh, you have skylights because you don't get to have side windows. You, you'll have other displays, but the natural lighting comes through the skylights and lots of it. And then you can have the conformal displays on the side of the airplane to do whatever you like. Stand up showers and all those things, things that we're not used to in today's airplanes, going into a lavatory. Uh, folks who have to stand up in the lavatory know that they put their head against the airplane <laughs> to do so. Uh, that's not something you have to worry about here. Think about sleeping in this airplane and looking, turning off the lights and looking up at the night sky with the whole atmosphere underneath you. You'd have the same view as astronauts. It'd be awesome. And here we are, it's Christmas Eve, we're in our biz jet, we're with our friends, we got a Christmas party going on in here, and we're flying over Manhattan, and that's the vision, that's the dream. That's what keeps us thinking about, we gotta just find a way to do this. The biz jet market is interesting, and we did a lot of work looking at that, and Honeywell did a full market analysis for us of what the capture would be. And we found that this could be a business in and of its own right, even if you didn't do a single out jetliner. And we checked with all these billionaires and they had a fabulous reaction. They wanted to buy it, they don't want to fund it. <laughs> they want to buy it. But the next generation, of course, where you really make a dent in the world by burning less fuel, making less waste gases in the atmosphere for the same passenger mile is in the commercial jetliner uh, arena. And this is what you'd be looking at in that market. And here you have a huge market, absolutely huge market. And we're talking about an airplane that would have 30% less direct operating cost and fuel burn, 25% lower cumulative airport noise, 25 dBs, that's about, about 8 dBs at each uh, reckoning point. 8 dBs is a lot quieter. Um, it's uh, divide by two, three times. Uh, the, uh, you also have twin aisles in this case, and if for the growth versions, you might have three aisles, but you have a very short cabin. If you look here, if you count from the front to back, there's a seat, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Whoa. Entering the airplane, going to the furthest seat is only 10 rows. The furthest I could ever be from a lav lavatory is 10 rows. I got to get to an emergency exit. The furthest I'd ever have to go is 10 rows. Amazing benefits. Earlier, I talked about this question of how do I grow a blender wing? If I can't make a family like I do today by making stretched airplanes, what am I going to do? Well, this is the... This is the notion I came up with on the airplane flying back from St. Louis with Bob Lieback. <laughs> we, we were just scratching our heads and I said, you know, we just got to cut it down the center line. We don't need to cut it fore and aft. We can't make an airfoil. And if we're smart, if we make this a straight line on the top and the bottom, left to right, and if we make this what's called a, um, it's a combination of inclined right cylinders at the point of max height, then I can have what's called second derivative continuity, even if I put plugs in. And this piece is the same as this piece. And the running loads from the wing tip into here are exactly the same because I've got the same air load and I got the same mass, at least up to here, the lift and the mass. So the shares and the moments are preserved even though I've grown the airplane. And I can grow it again. And the amazing thing about this process is that I add the floor space I need for more passengers. I add wing area and wing span. And the centroid of this added area is moving forward slightly, but it's, it's totally manageable relative to the aerocenter, which is also moving forward a bit. 
And so it balances quite well. So it is not only is it not a problem, it's profoundly better than a tube and wing, which grows the fuselage, stays with the same wings and wheels, and then gets root bound because every time you grow it, it flies a lesser distance. So the opportunity is tremendous and we want to jump in and do something. At this point in time, in 2018, we were still doing research. We were very bullish though. <laughs> we're gonna get out there and by golly, we're gonna, we're gonna go out and do something awesome. And that's what we were advocating. And now there's been a change, a really cool change. This is the new stuff, uh, Aaliyah, that uh, you and Ron haven't seen. So this is a talk I just gave uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, at the uh, International Workshop for Aviation and Climate Change hosted by University of Toronto, an international meeting where we all discussed with NASA and Pratt and & Whitney and GE and, every, and all the universities about what are we going to do in aviation to address aviation's challenge with climate change. And for this audience, I went way back in time. So here, so that's me in the middle. You wouldn't know it's me anymore. My colleague Blaine Rodden on the left and my colleague Bob Liebeck on the right, way back in the early days, um, we came up with what we would call the modern blended wing body. There have been other kind of blended wing body things. Of course, the B2 is a type of blended wing body. Um, uh, we were attacking it from a different angle to find a way to do a non-cylindrical pressure vessel and redistribute things and be much, much fatter than a B2. Uh, the, actually, this, this air, blended wings have a, a vastly more internal volume than a, than a B2. So it, it is a different, a different challenge. This is an instance where we were out fl flight testing on a very windy day. <laughs> we put the airplane up on a pole and we, we were exercising the flight controls and making sure that the uh, closed loop gains on the pitch roll and yaw dampers uh, were working properly with the alpha vane here on the nose and whatnot and the airspeed sensor out in front. Um, back in 95, we got a lot of press and the phone started ringing off the hook, but that was when it was McDonnell Douglas, very shortly when it became Boeing, then the, all the work was restricted to only doing research with Boeing and possibly doing military versions uh, under Boeing, but never a passenger version. And so that's when I jumped in and said, okay, guys, this is crazy. This is designed as a passenger jet. It's ready to go. Yes, it competes with the incumbent airplanes of both Airbus and Boeing. And yes, they're still selling them. Understand that. Um, that's great. More power to you. But that doesn't mean the rest of us have to wait around. Let's get going. So we won a NASA-sponsored X-Plane program. We appeared on the cover of Aviation Week back in 2016, I think it was. Um, in this case, I, I'm going back. Sorry, guys. I'm zigzagging back in time. This is working on the Killer Bee Bat again. This is for that audience talking to that history. Then we started working on our own airplane, the Ascent, as a biz jet that would grow into a single aisle replacement. Some of the images we saw before of what you could do with that airplane and uh, the transport versions and otherwise. So you've already talked about this as well. That was in the earlier discussion of, hey, NASA has done a lot of work and they've retired a huge amount of the risk. And they showed a 15 to 20% efficiency gain. And all the dust settled with all the work that they did collaboratively, collaboratively together, they lost some of the efficiency that we thought was achievable in the early days. And some of it was just simply reality hitting you. There were certain things that had to be addressed that hadn't yet been addressed. And they achieved a, a, a nice TRL, which meant that they were ready to get going if you wanted to produce something. But at design, we decided that there was an opportunity there that since Boeing, neither Boeing nor Airbus or Northrop or Lockheed or anybody was developing blended wings, we knew that we could go win patents that were easy, just lying around for the taking because no one was working on it as a product. And there was some research, but no one was actually trying to develop a product. And as we dug into developing a product that you could take to market, we found shortcomings that had to be addressed we found some things that were what we call lockup intellectual property, which means that, that we could play an interesting role. We're small. We don't yet have the resources to make this happen. How do we get in a place where we can be a partner 
in making this happen. Well, if we own the thing that the other guys have to have, then we get to play in the party. <laughs> That's what we did. We went out, we spent our own money, and we found intellectual property that no one was bothering with, bothering looking at. And we found something amazing um, that led us to gain another 10% efficiency above where NASA and Boeing had left it. I'm going to show you some of those things. The other thing we found doing all this work was that the airplane, the blender wing has often been regarded as a good candidate for liquid hydrogen because it, if you want to give it a lot of volume, you can put a T-plug in it in the middle, widen it a bit, and you get a, cr a tremendous amount of volume relative to the cost in friction wetted area. If you think about a, a cylinder airplane, if I want to widen the floor 10% to get 10% more people in, I got to do 20% more surface area because it's of the uh, uh, the I've got to increase both the width and the and the height of the airplane, and I get this larger, uh, much larger penalty in terms, of, especially in terms of the integrated running loads on the pressure vessel. So we we were not seeing that kind of a penalty, um, and we said this is something that has we can really address climate change without even talking about hydrogen, just burning jet A, we can help save the planet with 30% lower emissions than what's flying today with today's engines. Not the engines from 2005, but the engines we have today, you know, 20, 2015 on where the geared turbofan showed up, why we can use those engines and the airframe alone generates 30% lower fuel efficiency. Tremendously lower noise for the community, lower fuel burn for the airlines. Now, how do I make it a reality? And I convened this this august crowd of <laughs> of of fellows um and hey and also believe it or not we have some really awesome young people too but this is the first group we brought aboard and it was a lot of the parents of the original blended wing uh that included of course dr bob liebeck now retired from boeing blaine rodden retired from boeing brian moss the former president of gulfstream Preston Henney, the executive vice president of Gulfstream, developed the Gulfstream 5 through the Gulfstream 700, actually. Uh, Warren Willits, who is a owns uh, a uh, airline lease and finance company that is working with us as a surrogate for what the airlines are really looking for. And Professor Alon Crow from Stanford, who is also the father of the Z, of Z Aero and the WISC urban air mobility airplane. Also, he was one of the fathers of Arion, who unfortunately just recently announced that they were that they were done. But uh, Elon is an amazing mind. They said, "Let's, you're right. Let's launch now. Let's finish the research on that kooky landing gear. Let's go. Let's don't wait. Let's do a product. We're not doing research. We're not just going to go find more sponsorship money from research institutions. We want to go and develop the airplane as a product." We saw that before. So here's that pivot piston again. Here's that business of taking a double deck airplane where I can have a home for the landing gear and I can push down on the elevons back here and I've got enough leverage to pull the nose up. Well, here's what we did instead. We have the CG here, the main gear here, nose gear here, and we actually link the main gear and the nose gear with a thin hydraulic line passively, no pumps, no diaphragms, no boosters of any kind, it's all passive. So if I push on the back of the airplane, it teeter-totters about the center of gravity because these are hydraulically linked. The remarkable thing that we first, first thought was a penalty was now the nose gear is carrying a lot of the airplane weight, so it has to have brakes. We thought, dang it, we have to have brakes on the nose wheel. But of course, cars and race cars, the best braking comes from the front tires, and you can steer and brake at the same time just fine. And actually, I get more yield from brakes on the front than I do with brakes on the back that unload with braking. So we were we realized a 30% increase in braking effect for the same brakes, same rubber, same asphalt, same weight. We got uh, 0.3 Gs more deceleration. And this is what that looks like. So landing gear is a type of four bar link with a hydraulic cylinder that uh, uh, is compressed as this four bar link strokes 
the different positions. And then I have a link on the back that allows me to collapse it, flatten it, and hide it under the cockpit. And we have numerous patents now on, uh, we have utility patents and we have design patents on all kinds of varieties of this. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to go flight test a 25 foot demonstrator. We're getting that started now to go validate this technology and get it to a TRL of six or seven. And we're going to literally do exactly what the FAA would do in a performance flight test for a real jetliner. Uh, we're going to do uh, ground excels, max braking. We're going to do rejected takeoffs, continued takeoffs, single engine, all engine, abused rotations, um, all those things, map them, and then do it again with conventional landing gear and see if we indeed see this field length improvement that we're predicting and the braking improvement we're predicting. Also check all the failure modes. And the intent here is to, hey, let's start generation three. We've done the propeller, we, the propeller monocoque airplane was amazing. Uh, the jet age actually was horrible for fuel efficiency, absolutely awful. But the comfort was wonderful flying above the turbulence and the speed was fantastic. Now let's go back and recapture the efficiencies we enjoyed back with propellers and get it quiet uh, and clean. And uh, we believe this platform is the absolute best place to start. So with that, I'm going to stop it there for a second, take a breather, and let folks ask some questions if they would like. Wow, Mark, that was really impressive to see like how far the world of aviation has actually even come. But at the same time, I see so much opportunity in the next couple of decades for the next generation of airspace engineers to make a significant difference in like where aviation is heading. So thank you for that amazing, amazing history, uh, as well as the current situation of where we are. Fabulous. Yes. And that's just to set the stage now. So there's cool stuff happening with us and Blender Wings in the big world, in the, in the small end of the world, where we can do some even other completely amazing things on the different axis of working on the other axis of preserving our planet. Um, and preserving the, the, the variety of life on this planet, um, those benefits can be harvested for that. We've talked about that before. This airplane is just, it's just a naturally efficient platform. You've got to do some work. And those of you who've been looking at the aerodynamic challenges know that it's a different way of thinking about the airplane. It's actually quite a bit simpler. If someone were to start life learning about a flying wing, and then someone else came along and said, hey, here's the new airplane where we're going to take all the payload and put it in a long tube. And we're going to add a pair of wings on the back. And, and we're going to stick another wing on the back, sticking straight up. <laughs> you know, and if you went to your uh, research board and your manufacturing team and all those, guys, they'd say, this is an outrage. You're making the airplane more complex. How can you make this? How do you have any confidence that we can technologically do this? It's just a way, a, a different way of looking at things. In fact, uh, Flying wings have limitations, to be sure, but they eliminate complexity at a profound scale. Uh, something I tell my students all the time with uh, a flying wing type aircraft and blend wing type aircraft, when you design a bunch of airplanes with tails, T-tails and the cells and all that stuff, the first thing you learn is that they all stall at different conditions and that messy stalled wing wake hits something important, <laughs> usually the tail. <laughs> and all of a sudden, wait a minute, this is a wildly nonlinear problem. Now I got to figure out where the tail goes so that the reverser wake doesn't hit it and the stalled wing wake doesn't hit it. And, you know, so those things all start to vanish when you do a blended wing. It's not even a consideration. You have other constraints. You don't have the tail to bail you out. <laughs> so you got the outer wing tip is your stabilizer now. So you've got to think, hmm, how do I do that? How do I keep an upload on it so I get to use the span efficiently? I don't want to have to put a download on it at cruise. It's okay to have a download for takeoff and landing flare, but not for cruise. The outer wing better be lifted up. And that's the challenge. How do you do that? How do you twist it? How do you pick the airfoils so that you get a good near lift expand load for cruise? But when you pull the nose up to get to max lift, you got some CL max to work with so that you can take off and land at low speeds or even just fly at low speeds. 
Um, these airplanes, these endurance and ranger and long range electric airplanes, we're flying in like 1.2 V stall. The Global Hawk flies at 1.08 V stall. <laughs> 8% faster than stall speed. It's just a burp away from stalling. That's where it has to fly. The slower we can fly, the more efficient it is in endurance. Um, that's not always the best thing for range, of course. You want to fly a bit faster for the best range, but you still don't want to fly super fast. You still want to be, you know, closer to CL max than to CL zero. That's for sure. So yeah, that's the challenge for all you guys to fix. It's funny to hear you say don't go super fast, given the fact that you were you were also designing race cars. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Oh, I agree. Yes. yes. Really work. <laughs> how how can you not want to go fast? Yeah. But you know, actually, I, looking at how you approach designing an aircraft, I I love it. I I just love it, and I think it reminds me of my first opportunities to really see this in the field. We were down at an airport Air Force base in Florida. And we had Boeing was there, Raytheon was there, Northam was there, and then Aurora Flight Sciences was there with MIT students that had literally just, I think some of them had just graduated, some were like finishing up, and they had this foam aircraft. It looked like a pizza box size, right? And all the other guys, older guys, had these, you know, big machines and heavy duty, and it was complicated stuff. I'm watching what's happening on this field because it was a demonstration. All, all the companies were going to demonstrate their aircraft. I, I can't remember if it was Boeing or Raytheon or Northam. They had one of their aircraft and supposedly something broke on it. Now they had enough money to um, get a helicopter to bring some part and their engineer <laughs> from Chicago fly him in to Florida to fix wow. the issue so kids, they could do their demonstration. We were talking about the cost of that. I think it was like $150,000. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what conservation organization is going to have that kind of money? <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at the team from Aurora with MIT students, and they've got this foam aircraft. They throw it up in the air, and it takes off, and it does its thing, comes down, and I think one time it landed and had a little nick in in it. All they did was take some duct tape, put it over, and back up in the air. I was so inspired. I was like, wow, that's brilliant, because what you want is you want to complete your mission. You don't want to have to sit around with this fancy machine if it can't do the job. So just, you know, going back and looking at how you were saying, okay, can I cut this out? How can I make it versatile, not necessarily perfect? How can I make it where it's interchangeable in the long run? Because a lot of times we get stuck in the detail and focus on we've got to get this, whether it's the speed or whether it's, you know, center of gravity, we get so fixated on that one aspect that we forget that it's the overall goal, which is mm -hmm. for, for us especially, if we're flying in the field, we want it to be easy to snap together and I heard one of your aircrafts you could snap together in the dark which I was impressed right. with of course <laughs> so you know that's one key thing is, is putting it together making it easy for any person average person that doesn't have all that electrical or mechanical background experience is able to connect it and get it out in the field and then um, I love teaching how to build drones versus just buying a DJI is because the the ability to understand how a system works, but easy enough where things can be replaced in the field. For our work especially, it just makes it a lot more cost efficient and we can continue doing our work. So um, that was kind of my goal from the very beginning in, in Africa, to have an aircraft that's easy to assemble, low cost, and very smart, and that's why we need the computer science combined with aviation, but you know, just watching watching and hearing you again today has inspired me again to be like, oh my gosh, yes, that's right. That's what we want. We want Eagle Ray to be something that is not just looks good, does the job, but it's going to be easy to put together. It's going to be able, uh, we're going to be able to modify and change it depending on the mission because we don't know how it's going to fly at 18,000 feet. We really don't know what to expect at that altitude or higher altitude or mm -hmm. perhaps even some of the lower altitudes. So I think 
the important lesson for me from your talk was for the rest of the team, you know, keep your mind open. Don't, don't get fixated, but think about how can we expand or retract the aircraft if we need to um, as we get into real, uh, the real mission itself. So, Mark, yes. thank you for that. Well, Testing and, everybody and the, yes, and, and there's a, the, 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 the principal story to remember is you want to design it for optimality, yes, and then you need to stop and then work backwards towards practicality and utility and reliability, all illities, then just spend a bunch of time saying, I'm going to accept a little drag there. I'm going to do this a little bit there. It's okay because it'll make it bulletproof in the field when people really care and really need it. And so that's one thing. Um, then you can come back to optimality later. Of course, you start with optimality, get it close. But when you start the real design, the practicality, reliability has to be, has to be there. Um, uh, I was going to say there's other two before before I go into questions. There's two things that I wanted to mention that I would say anybody doing electric airplanes, you need to be looking at hard. Uh, and maybe you guys were all over it already. Some of you might have uh, done some work with what are called field oriented controllers, FOC controllers, sometimes called sine wave controllers. And these are electronic speed controllers for your electric motor that do it the way inverters are done on big airplanes and big electrical systems and not the way hobby <laughs> ESCs work, which use square waves. And at 100% throttle, they're just as good at a, as a sine wave. If you're flying part throttle, which you better be, because you're, you're gonna need to be at full throttle to climb. If you're gonna be cruising at part throttle, you're throwing a bunch of energy away through electronic speed controllers. And you can recover 10 to 15% of endurance uh, and uh, 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 range just by going to a field-oriented controller or a sine wave controller. They aren't on the market in very many places, but there's a, uh, a freeware <laughs> public domain uh, FOC controller that you can download from the internet if you don't mind doing a little soldering yourself. <laughs> you can get the pieces. so. Uh, somebody on your teams, if they haven't already yeah. done it, definitely look into that. We've been testing them. They're awesome. They reduce the electromagnetic interference on your electronics, on your GPS. They get rid of electromagnetic in interference at a, at the, at profoundly. So all your sensors uh, work better and your transmitters have better range. Everything is better with these, these controllers. So that's something I would definitely be looking at too. Just a little sideshow, but important. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's definitely exciting. I, I'm going to have to jump on the soldering machine and get to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you bet. Yes, and happy right. to take questions. All right, guys, question time. Don't be scared. Um, start? So Thank you, Jonah. What I'm hearing. For the uh, drone, we should try to make it uh, modular and simple. Is that correct? Yes, I, I think that, that um, I, I would definitely consider making it uh, modular and accessible, uh, which are simple words to say and just throw around. But um, it's really a very objective, it can be a very objective thing. Uh, the, and the reason you do it is simply because everything in the future is uncertain. So just help yourself. <laughs> help whoever that poor person is. It might be you who in maybe three months is going to be flight testing this thing. And, oh, you buried the electronic speed controller. You have to dismount the motor to get to the speed controller. <clears throat> you don't want to do that. Um, oop, I whacked a wingtip and I broke the wingtip off. Well, it'd be nice if you could just tape it back on. Yes. <laughs> or maybe you should have had a little skid there. Um, somebody comes along and says, hey, we got a, we found a whole new sensor that can really do the leopard tracking thing. We can get, we can get wide field of view and we can get spot shots. With high, but guess what? This thing is shallow and now it's a foot wide on each side. Well, you might need a new belly pan to accommodate it. 
and you'd rather not throw away the center body to incorporate the new payload. So think about how you can make that center body flexible so that you can change your mind completely about what goes in there and rearrange it. And we, you have to respect the fact that it has to still balance. <laughs> so think about that. Say, well, okay, if I want to have the flexibility to add new things and move things around, but I got to preserve balance, well, maybe I should have two battery packs so I can split them left and right and move them outboard if it needs a big inboard. I don't know, but things like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a quick question. Um, this is more like, just from your personal, like, why do you think the, like, BWBs haven't uh, caught on so much? Like, why do you think Boeing was so adamant to not pursue this in the, in the past? And now we see more of an influx, but, like, why is it taking so long for it to pick up? So, so there's a wonderful book, I think I've recommended this before, called The Innovator's Dilemma by a guy named Christensen. It was a bestseller 10 years ago. And it was the foundation of everything that people learn in business school today. Uh, the Innovator's Dilemma explains it beautifully. The author had a question. He's tried to start up. He made something better. It's sort of like the beta. Remember Betamax and VHS? You kids won't remember that. <laughs> but th when there was a war between how are we going to record video, there was beta and what was the other one? There was beta and VHS. VHS won, even though beta was better in every way. But VHS just got out ahead. They just swamped the market and got out there, and Beta never never made it. And once there was that big of a footprint for VHS, it didn't matter that Beta was bigger. It was irrelevant. Um, they had sunk investment, and they, were gonna, they could make money forever, and that's all it is. You've got an airplane. You can continue selling it until the first person says, I'm going to make it a jet this time instead of a prop, <laughs> or I'm going to go to swept wings instead of straight wings, whatever. Until that first person does it, nobody else has to do it. Airbus and Boeing can both make plenty of money, and they're making money hand over fist with an airplane that was certified. The 737 first flew in, was it 1962? And the A320 first flew in 1982. The 737 is still a killer competitive airplane because they put a lot of work into the wings, but they couldn't touch the landing gear. And they couldn't touch the fuselage, and they couldn't touch the cockpit, and they couldn't touch the tails. Why? <laughs> because the FAA granted them a grandfather clause that allowed the 737 wing, body, tail, landing gear, as long as they didn't change anything but skin gauge, to respect only the older requirements from the 1960s. All the new requirements, safety requirements that have been added since, the Airbus has to carry, but not the 737. And that's why the 737 can stay neck and neck with Airbus. It's not because of advanced technology. It's because of they get to play to a different set of rules that's, that's supported by the FAA and in flight test has been proven out. But nonetheless, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's, a, it's a weird little thing. So guess what? Boeing has a very good product. Of, you know, 737 has got a lot of beatings lately, but it's still an outstanding product. Overall, fabulous safety record. Um, does the job really well. Uh, and the A320 does the job really well, too. They have no reason to jump to something more efficient for them, not to sell airplanes and serve the, you know, what is their reason? It's not their responsibility to save the earth. Other people are going to have to decide to do that. Frankly, it's not the airline's responsibility to save the earth. We'd love it to be, but it isn't. It just isn't. Um, it's not our dentist's responsibility to save the earth either. <laughs> and just because the airplane guys may have more of an influence on the earth doesn't mean that they're going to be motivated to do anything. So I say that simply to, simply to point out that it actually is rational for them not to do the blender wing. It's the most rational thing for them to do. For the world, it's not the most rational thing to do. For all the stakeholders, it's not the most rational thing to do. So we have to jump out and say, okay, we got to get away from the gatekeepers and find another way to introduce this technology for the benefit of the broader world, because it will help the airlines, it will help the airline customers, but the airlines don't get to pick the blended wing. 
the airlines get to pick the airplane that Boeing or Airbus gives them, <laughs> you know. So, so the short answer is that's it. It's just that simple. Uh, until someone introduces the first one, no one has to introduce it. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, just, just I'm sorry, because I just said a quick follow up to that. Just like so, basically, it's like unless there's competition for Boeing to actually, you know, think about actual BWBs, they're just going to be like, oh, let's just keep what we have going because it's working, right? Yeah, that's right. No, that's right. And and uh, so uh, it is a sad, you know, we do have a duopoly right now. Uh, Comac in China is going to become stronger. Uh, sadly, the C919 that they've designed and the C929 that's on the drawing boards that are not competitive, even though they have all kinds of advanced technology, they're, they're just not competitive airplanes. So they won't force a, a, a better race. Um, so when I launched this company, Blend Wing Aircraft um, made a, a substantial personal investment, teamed with some awesome people on the outside. We now have 20 people working towards it. We're out here, we're out here at uh, Spirit Aerosystems today at their headquarters, I had lunch with their CEO. We're, we're trying to find a way to um, carry this thing forward and start building a community, just like just like uh, Aaliyah and Ron have done, building a community of interested parties who have different skill sets, but a common goal. Well, same thing here. We've got different parties, different, we're gonna need investors, we're gonna need airlines, we're gonna need uh, flight attendants, pilots, and others to advocate to do this and to make it happen. And it'll be a business proposition, just as we on this project, we need money, <laughs> we need technology, we need some passion, um, we need software, uh, we need sensors, uh, we need operations specialists, just people who want to muscle stuff around and make it happen. Uh, all those things have to show up and get going uh, to actually do it. We're in the same boat. But where are we getting somewhere? We're all, or both of us are getting somewhere. Thank you. I got a question about uh, the VTOL technology. Um, you were promoting VTOL uh, technology in your new products. Now, uh, quite the, some persons say, well, VTOL means that you're carrying a lot of additional weight with you. Uh, which basically makes things less efficient. But on the other hand side, um, you were also talking about the speed uh, envelope. And I think um, often this is not being regarded in the development of airframes because, I mean, if you have a VTOL technology, you don't need to care about stall uh, speed because, I mean, you have always the security of, of, of lift. So you can make your uh, airframe basically more efficient in a, or more efficient for crews without looking at takeoff or landing speeds. So now, what is your opinion about VTOL? Is it bringing something and how much does it bring and where does it bring benefits? That's a, those are, that's a great question and you framed it well. Um, because you're right, you if if I don't have to take off and land on the wing, I can make slinky little racy wings <laughs> that are very efficient, especially if I want to fly fast. That's my mission. And range will be asked for more speed. Endurance time on station asks for slower speed, lower power. The the uh, so the, the short answer is if you look at the history of VTOL. The first VTOL airplanes were all fighters with jet engines, which had enough thrust to stand on the tail already. <laughs> um, VTOL and way fast and super go fast are perfect mates. They they share the same engine and the same engine chore, even though they're inefficient in VTOL. I don't have to put a special engine on necessarily for VTOL. I got to do some other special stuff. So those things have been around for 40 years. VTOL jets, you know fighters, the Harrier and uh, the Russian counterparts have been around forever um, and they're amazing. That's easy. Actually, VTOL with endurance on lightweight, fluffy airplanes is pretty hard. Those are very divergent missions, very divergent missions. Um, uh, so, th so then you ask, well, what's the big, why is everyone going so nuts about this? Um, uh, there's a convergence of a couple things. Uh, electric 
aircraft, of course, offer the potential for silence or near silence or much, much quieter than helicopters. It might not be obvious to you folks, but helicopters are weird machines. They are actually, even though they have big giant rotors, they have very high disc loading. The amount of weight per unit disc area is very high. And the reason for that is that if they want to fly fast in edgewise flight, the retreating blade better still be going almost as fast as the advancing blade. <laughs> that means that the rotational tip speed has to be multiples higher than the edgewise flight speed. And the only way you can make that happen is with a small diameter rotor. So helicopters are actually terrible hovering airplanes. They have terrible hover efficiency, just awful, almost as bad as a quad. Uh, you know, quadcopters are actually better than helicopters in hover efficiency, even though it doesn't seem like it. Um, in part, it's a square cube law thing, but um, they're not that bad. Um, but a lot of the VTOL things that are out there are pretty, they're not so great either. If you look at the Lilium from Germany, beautiful thing. Again, if you want to go fast, VTOL kind of comes easy, but the VTOL is very inefficient and it's very loud. Um, <clears throat> so what does all that mean? The thing that, that electrics have allowed us is to pay a smaller price for adding VTOL than we ever had before, because fundamentally VTOL and cruise flight, they may require similar horsepower, but whatever, if you're driving a prop and a rotor, they require vastly different RPMs <laughs> to be efficient or if I pick an engine and a rotor system that does both, they're inefficient in both modes. But you can do that, and it could still be a, a, a winner if the option is that you need an airport. So the VTOL stuff, since it allows a different concept of implementation, concept of operation, it's runway independent, that's a whole different capability. And so I don't have to necessarily beat a fixed wing runway airplane because it can't do anything I want wherever I want, whenever I want, but the VTOL can. So for the Beta Alia airplane, UPS is one of their first customers. They're going to change, they're going to completely rethink the distribution network once they can fly to the backyard of a mom and pop shop that's making you know, those ducks that stick in your front yard with the wings that spin <laughs> and how do they pick those up and how they take them to the distribution center. Well, this a little beta Alia um, or a Joby airplane, uh, something like that, that could do it very efficiently, quietly, uh, without runway dependence, open up an entirely new market and actually save uh, energetically, be more efficient because I'm not uh, uh, turning the entire world into one node for the whole country, right? Like, you know, FedEx has to take everything to the central place in uh, Memphis and then redistribute. Well, if I can change the network to have more nodes on the airframe side, that's what this thing will allow. Wow, they're going to have uh, efficiencies for their operations that they never had before. So even though the airplane itself isn't as efficient as a little airplane of a similar size and weight that's on the runway, in the network, it's more efficient. I think Matthew, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I had a question about um, the manufacturing of the blended wing body. If like, what complications? come up between blending between like the body and the wing smoothly. So, like, right. So, so this day and age, there's almost nothing. So if you have a 3d printer or any CNC machine to make the mold, uh, you can make beautiful continuous things. So it's, even though it's kind of swarfy, right. It's got, you know, smooth shapes that are more complex than a rectangle or a cylinder or, or a simple tapered airfoil. In reality, if you say that I have to have a cylinder and a simple tapered airfoil, now I've got to mate them. I've got to mate structures of two different species through lugs or mounts where the loads gate become extremely concentrated. 
then I got to redistribute those loads and flow them out into the shell of the cylinder, flow them into the wing mounts and flow them out into the shell of the wing. That's complexity. So the swarfiness, um, in some ways, the tooling that you need to make it, it could be more complex. You could, you could call it more complex. But in most ways, it's really dumb and simple. You saw the three-piece airplane we did. We actually built the three-piece airplane. <laughs> the airframe was three pieces, and that made a fuel tank naturally out of three pieces. And, and all the controls were already mounted, and it didn't have any hinges or didn't have any uh, – I just used live hinges. Um, I mounted the servos straight to those surfaces, and off we went. So there's really – because it's so flat, there's a lot of opportunity for manufacturing and simplicity. Um, you have to be creative, yes. And tubes and wings have lots of benefits, too. Um, one of the benefits is the wing's a wing and the tube's a tube. <laughs> I can design them independently and then mate them. The cost is in the mating. I have the, the similar things that have to line up and meet and reflow the loads. That's a cost. But in terms of imagining and engineering and designing the pieces one at a time, that's a kind of efficiency, right? It is, it is kind of efficient. It is pretty cool. With a blended wing, you have to think about them all simultaneously. That's not so cool. But in the end, you get a better performing system. Um, and then how do you choose, like, which airfoils to use? Like, ah. the blending of those, yeah. So the airfoils are are interesting. Um, if... Um, I know we've had some talks about um, at the end of Vortex Lattice Code AVL. And we've had some talks uh, from um, on the um, uh, oh gosh, what's the what's the awesome tool? I'm I'm drawing a blank, uh, Leah, that our buddy has made. Um, anyway, there's some other great tools that allow us to do some rapid aerodynamic analysis. I'm an old school guy, so I'm still using Athena Vortex Lattice, and I use Xfoil for the airfoils. And here's the challenge, actually. Hold on here, just one second. I actually was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if, let's see if, um, I, well, well, uh, well, you guys just discuss amongst yourself. I'm going to try to find, <laughs> I'm gonna try to find the AVL file for the last one that I sent you guys. WCUAV. And we can, I'll show you how I play with it, how I do the process. Mark, when you started, did you have all these software tools to be able to, like, design and actually see what the airfoil looks like? Or did you have to do a lot of calculation early on, on your own? Yeah. Yeah, so I definitely had to evolve the airfoils. No question about it. I had to evolve them uh, 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 myself to start with. And... Uh, but it was not stuff that others hadn't done before. And uh, so people who had been looking at this problem um, had, okay, let's see, I'm getting closer. I think I'm getting warm. <laughs> um, people who had done this before uh, had similar challenges. Uh, certainly the B2 guys uh, had to look at this. Other people, just hobbyists, making blended wings that had kind of a body in the middle, had you know played with this before. Um, the, the, the first thing to know is that at cruise, I really want to have a near elliptic span load. Not perfect ellipse, but close. I really do. Because if I do, then I can get all the benefits. I can get all of the efficiency benefits. I ring, it, I ring all of them out. Um, and then the second thing, though, is I really always have to design every airplane that's on the wing at two points at least. One point is uh, uh, is the point where I have to say, okay, I've got to cruise, but then I've got to be able to slow down a maneuver. I have to have some maneuvering capability. I've got to be able to pull some couple tenths of a G at least to turn and flare and so forth. And if I have to take off and land off a runway, then I have real demand. If I'm catapult launched, it's different. Um, so... Um, uh, you know what? I'm actually not finding my stuff right away here. Um, so I typically find myself doing uh, the design work. I'm really looking almost always at only three points, three point design. I go to the mid CG, whatever I think the middle CG is. 
and I'd work on the airplane and I'd pick airfoils that give me the lift expand load. Then I go to FCG and I make sure that my static margin, my pitch stability is what I want. So I, you, these autopilots can take a little bit of instability, by the way, but I, if you don't want to go there, ah, leave five or 10% static margin left over. That's CM alpha divided by CL alpha equal 0.05 negative is stable, so-called 5% stable. Um, and the next thing I do is I go to the forward CG. I'm always going to need to CG range, folks. <laughs> Whatever your CG compartment is, you better say that the CG uh, could, I could take that load inside that compartment and move it 15% of the length forward, 15% of the length aft, add in the rest of the airplane and calculate the CG range I get. I better be able to do something like that. Otherwise, it's not a very useful payload compartment. So I go to forward CG and I see what's the max lift I can generate. Why do I do that? Uh, because I need to know um, if I can maneuver, uh, if I have some maneuvering headroom for my cruise point. If I'm cruising around at a CL of one, hopefully my CL max is 1.6 or 1.8 or something. If my CL max, let's say that my CL max is 1.4, that tells me the square root of that is uh, about 1.2. That means I can go 20% faster than stall speed, fly around, and if I slow down, I'll, I can either pull 0.44 Gs or I can uh, fly 20% faster than stall speed. I can do either of those things. Okay, I can maneuver. It's not a lot of maneuvering. Most pilots would hate that narrower band. But for performance, it's fine. With an autopilot, it's just fine. Um, so uh, I look at those three points. Cruise mid-CG, get the best plan form efficiency, uh, E, which is getting it more elliptic. Uh, then I look at FCG at that same cruise point, see if it's stable. Then I go to the forward CG and see if I can get a CL max that's good. If my CL max is really good, slow the airplane down or make the wings smaller so let me show you this let me try this let's see if this works <laughs> ah, oops that didn't work <laughs> okay i'm gonna let me see if it comes up okay it came up okay what i'm going to do is i'll take screen control again Let me find the right knob to push. Okay, I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna do share, share my screen. I'm gonna pick that, I'm gonna do share. Okay, folks, tell me if you're seeing in a moment, hopefully you'll be seeing. Okay, do you see an airplane? Yep. Okay, so those of you who use AVL, you'll recognize this. Here's an airplane, here's one of our Eagle Rays. There's the airplane. This is one with airfoils that I liked a lot. But some of them are proprietary, so I couldn't share them just yet. So here I, I, I'm now I'm going to fetch. Uh, I think it's AR. So I'm going to fetch the run files. Okay. Let me try. Let's see. I'm going to fetch the run files. Let me try. I think it's run case. Oops. I'm going to just take a look. Let's see. I'm going to let's go faster than that faster than that okay here's a seal i'm going to pick a point i would not, you guys may not even know what i'm doing i'm selecting a case to run that's at a lift coefficient of 1.0 at mid center gravity so i'm going to tell the code hey take a look at the airplane i drew here the airfoil stacks i selected there's the treps plane this is where i start what i want to see is this this is the left wing tip the right wing tip this is the lift coefficient Green is actually the lift times the cord divided by a reference cord. That's the thing I want to look like an ellipse. If that looks like a perfect ellipse, then this is going to equal one or better. Why is this better than one? Why is it better than 100% efficient? Because I have winglets. So my winglets allow this to be better than one. But the fact that I have my winglets on and I've twisted it so that I actually do see something bigger than one. That's a good sign. <laughs> That's telling me, okay, I've got the vortex drag in reasonable shape. I got some nasty bumps. Those aren't perfect, but okay. So this is telling me, hey, I'm not doing too bad. How much elevator did it take to trim? 
oh, one and a half degrees, that's not so bad. So the wing's twisted pretty good. I'm cruising at a seven degree angle of attack. I got a lift coefficient of one. I got an E of one uh, of 1.05, I got a CL of one. This airplane, I think, ended up, I think the CL was, you know, 20 or something. The lift to drag ratio is 20 when I put the parasite drag in. So this is looking good. So now let me go and let me ask the question, what does it look like if I, if I and by the way, let me do this too, G. I'm going to put low, LO for loading. So there's the loading. That's what the airplane, that's what the airplane load distribution, the delta P on each of those panels, the delta pressure, what it looks like. And you notice I got big spikes on the outer wing. I got little tiny spikes on the inner wing. And yet I looked, remember when I integrate all those things up, I saw that the um, the loading, and I got a download at the back that's trimming, small upload in the front. When I integrate all those up, we're still making an elliptic span load. It looks like the outer wings are working too hard compared to the inner wings. In fact, they're not. I integrate those little rectangles. I get, I show that the inner wing in here I, I don't have as much load, a big spike at the leading edge of pressure lift, but I've got more extent. So when I go from tip to tip, I get a nice elliptic span load. And you can see the winglets are carrying load. They should be lifting inward. They should lift the same direction as the inner wing. If my winglets are working to help me reduce drag, they should be acting as sails, taking the uh, vortex flow, induced flow angles, and recovering some of the drag by by uh, uh, straightening the flow, if you will. So here's an airplane that so far looks good. It didn't have much elevator at trim. I had a high trim lift coefficient. I had a very good uh, elliptic, um, uh, had a very good E. Let's go back and try this now. Let's, let's go back and let's take a look at CL Max. Okay, here's, I'm gonna try a CL of 1.6. So 1.6, so I could probably I, I could fly this thing at 1.25 V stall. I could fly at CL1, fly 25% faster than the stall. At CL mat, because I'm at square root of, of 1.6 is maybe 1.25, 1.27 or something like that. So I can fly 27% faster than the stall and I'm doing just fine. I can slow down to stall speed if I want, or at my cruise speed, I can pull up at 1.6 Gs because cruise is at CL1. CL max is 1.6. I can pull it up to stall and instantaneously get 1.6 Gs. That's plenty. I just need a few tenths of a G on these slow flying uh, uh, airplanes. So let's take a look at that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to process that, that case and let's look at the span loading. Now the span load looks very different. I've got 1.6 CL. <clears throat> My E is pretty terrible, but I don't care. This is for CL max. I need 21 degrees of elevon. Eh, that's maybe a little more than I'd like, but it's okay. 17 degrees angle of attack, but gall darn it, I got 1.6 CL. If things work the way I think they do, here in green is the span load. I don't care about the span load. Now what I care about is the red line. That's the lift coefficient perpendicular to the leading edge of the wing if it's swept. That's the one I care about. And I want to make sure that every airfoil I picked that its CL max is less than the CL I see here. If it is, then I can actually achieve this CL max three-dimensionally. So let me say it again. So it's saying here at like station 40 inches, my airfoil better be able to uh, generate 1.8 CL max as an airfoil in X foil. If it can, yay. If not, I got troubles. But here's the other thing. Out here, the span load has been dumped because the elevons are pushing the wing tip down on a stable airplane. I better go in here and I want to make sure that with 21 degrees of flap deflection on that outer wing, that that airfoil seal max is way above 0.7. Here, I don't want it being perfectly at stall. I want margin out here. I have what I call an 80-80 rule. Let's just say that this airfoil is the first one to stall. This airfoil is the most highly loaded and the CL max, let's say that it does stall there. But the actual CL that I 
want and the CL that I need have been matched. And this airfoil section right there, whatever airfoil I picked, its CL max is 1.8 or a little better. Yay, 1.85 or something. Then I need to come out here. I look at that airfoil I've picked out here. I deflect the flap 21 degrees trailing edge up. I run it in X-foil, see what the lift curve looks like. I want to make sure that the CL max I see is way above this. In fact, I want the CL max that I see to be uh, 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 about 80% of the CL that I have here. So at 80% span, about, I want the CL max of this guy to be 80%, no more than 80% uh, than of the CL max at the critical station. So that's a little complicated, but the basic thing I'm saying is when I have the airplane at CL max, I want the stall critical station inboard so the airplane will pitch down. I want the wing tip to have margin. I don't want the stall critical station to be out here. I want to have margin. And, and then so what I do is I start playing with the airfoils. That means I pick an airfoil here that has a pretty high CL max. And I pick an airfoil here that has a pretty high CL max too. In fact, I find out that this airfoil really probably can't have as good a CL max as that one. I need this to be the critical station. So either through plan form shaping, twist, or the airfoil selection, I get that kind of a balance. So I know that's a little bit uh, a little bit involved, but uh, maybe it'll at least give you guys some pause to think about how you want to how you want to think about it. Does that help, guys? Or is it just a blur? <laughs> Might yeah, be a blur. It was a lot of information, but it was helpful. <laughs> okay, what's well, yeah? That, that that was. I think it was it was very well done. And then this was recorded, so these guys can definitely go back and watch it. And I think when they'll watch it again, they'll have a better understanding of what and how you explain how to you know select the different um, airfoils as well. Sorry, I didn't show it. Mm -hmm. And what I do, let's, let's open, uh, do you guys all have XFLR5? I hope you do because it's so great. Boy, it's taking its time. It's not helping me out here at all. I think they're going to be using OpenCV. Okay. OpenVSP, sorry. OpenVSP? Yes. Yep. So let me show you. Oh, OpenVSP is awesome. It's just old brain, old dog, new tricks for me. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just show you something. So here's here's um, XFLR5, which is uh, which is just X foil on steroids, um, and I want to show you uh, a little trick. So what I've got here is I've been running a bunch of airfoils. Let's just pick this one, green one here, set Y zero, whatever, whatever the heck that is. What does that airfoil look like? It looks like that. That's my blended wing airfoil for the transonic airplane. That's the center body. You can see the cockpit in the front. That's an airfoil that has a CL max of, ooh, it's got some funny, this is like 1.6 at this high Reynolds number. And it's got not a really great lift curve slope, but I don't need it to have a great lift curve slope. And the alpha zero lift is a funny shift. But my outer wing, let's go out to like uh, 492 or something. Which one is that? Or let's see. Yeah, let's take, well, I'll take one of my outboard airfoils. I better have some good CL max there. So that's a thinner airfoil, right? That airfoil you can see down here, what that looks like. Let's run that airfoil at a normal cruise CL of, actually, there's probably run at a pretty high cruise CL. That's what the pressure distribution looks like. And this is circulation coefficient as opposed to pressure coefficient. Pretty uniform loading, a lot of aft camber. And when I go and look at drag, here's what I want to see. Most airfoils, if you guys don't know this, here's a piece of gold. <laughs> I'm giving you guys gold. Um, um, I pick 0.02 for a very particular reason. Somewhere between 0.017 and 0.025 is where all airfoils without flaps and slats stall, no matter what. And that's funny. All the Reynolds number effects are captured in that drag coefficient. How can that possibly be? It's because most of the drag of an airfoil, when it's stalling, 
is on the upper surface. The upper surface drag is the integral of the upper surface circulation that's left in the flow and in the wake. That is the thing that has to be conserved. When the circulation accumulation on the upper surface exceeds a certain point, the flow decides that a better flow pattern is a separation vortex and for the flow to go shooting over the top and there's a trap vortex it may be very turbulent and chaotic but it's fundamentally a very large trap vortex it decides that's the lower energy state so strangely drag coefficient all by itself no matter what the reynolds number is i could be going 150,000 or 15 million the drag coefficient at stall is about 0.02 so you learned it here folks um, but i'm not the guy who discovered that um, so what, what does that mean? Well, sometimes I can't believe X-foil. Sometimes it's keeping going and telling me really encouraging lift coefficients. If as long as you make sure that the CL max never exceeds the CL where the drag equals 0.02, you'll be safe. Mark, how do you decide on wingtip going up versus down? How is that selected? That's a great question. So for me, what I did um, for the killer bee, um, why did we put the winglets down? Well, when I was doing that AVL analysis, uh, the wing tips facing up, the vortex, uh, they sometimes make some thrust, sometimes they make some vortex drag. Um, but uh, usually they're making thrust. If I've designed it right, the winglets are actually pushing the airplane forward. The inner wing is making more drag than the outer wing is pushing forward, but wingtips on all airplanes actually thrust forward. Probably didn't know that, but so uh, no matter how draggy it is, <laughs> the wingtips are still thrusting forward compared to the inner wing. So if I cut the wingtip off and put a balance in there, I'd actually see thrust on the outer wing up to a point. That's the... Uh, uh, that's because the outer wing is surfing in the upwash of the inner wing, just like a surfer is gets thrust by sliding downhill. Um, and that's why birds fly in formation off the wingtip of their neighbors, because there's an upwash there, and your wingtip isn't an upwash from its inner wing. So, um, so the wingtip is actually thrusting. Well, if the wingtip is above the wing, it's pushing my nose down. It's not helping me trim. So I put the winglet on the bottom, it pushes the nose up and I can, when I design the whole airplane, I get a better trim deficiency and I get more CL max. Now, if you have right. landing gear, you might not want that. You might not want the winglet oh, sticking down. Yeah, we were, I think we were thinking about the, the downward facing wingtips with landing gear. Cause, cause, so I what mean, you do I, is this, you make the wingtips the landing gear, just put wheels in the wingtips, put a long nose gear on, it works awesome. Uh, have the airplane sitting at like a six or eight degree attitude for takeoff and landing. It's unbelievable. Uh, if you Google, if you Google um, killer bee jet, you'll see a video uh -huh. of, of a killer bee that we made with wingtip wheels and a special landing gear, two position landing gear on the nose. It hold, held the nose up for takeoff and it lowered the nose for landing so it wouldn't bounce. And it's a jet, oh, yeah. and yeah, okay. and uh, my my buddy Ewald Schuster built it and flew it with that jet. It was absolutely awesome. It worked beautifully. Um, it's not without issues. <laughs> there could be issues, but it works great. I'll share it here. Okay, so right, other questions, uh, guys. Mark, uh, about the winglets, uh, uh, just one question. I mean, there are people in NASA or former people from NASA promoting avoiding winglets and um, going for um, flattening basically the winglets um, into the surface of the of the wing, like uh, the parental D wing. What's yes. your opinion about that? Th uh, that's absolutely valid. And, and uh, so it's, it depends on what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, so uh, usually, it, let's put it this way, the best winglet is flat. <laughs> when people say, let's do a winglet dihedral study, how should the winglet be? 15 degrees above horizontal, 90 degrees. They always find the winglet should be flat. Now, with a structural constraint, often you will also find, you ultimately, if you do it carefully like Prandtl, you will find that a flat wing is, is often better. 
If you have span constraints, the winglet is great. If you need some good yaw stability, if you need an airplane that has some turn coordination, sometimes winglets will do it. But honestly, the Prandtl wing is also pretty famous for having innate turn coordination. So the short answer is um, there's a lot there's a lot to be said for that. Now the Prandtl wing doesn't have good yaw damping, so it tends to Dutch roll. Um, but uh, that aside. Um, uh, it's a perfectly good way to go. And uh, if you address Dutch roll and you don't have any engine out requirements or you don't have any span requirements that would want you to bend the wing for some reason, it should be more optimal. Yes. Prandtl. Mark, well, last question on, on uh, wing tips. So a lot of my airspace engineering comes from observing birds. Yes. <laughs> and... One thing, like let's say you're thinking about um, a big Raptor, right? Because that would be more of a long endurance aircraft. Um, they have obviously individual feathers. And then I think about wing wingtips from the perspective of ours are fixed, but as birds, they are able to either have their wings kind of like tip up or down. Mm -hmm. Has anybody been working on any kind of mechanism which allows it to be more agile, flexible as bird tips? There's been, you know, there has been, there has been some cool research on that. There really has been, um, and there are some reasons why you might do either one. You, a lot of people are familiar with wingtip sails, which are an emulation of eagle or uh, condor wingtips. Um, it's just splitting the wingtip into multiple individual elements that are curved up or maybe dihedral up at a different angle and you make kind of a vortex sheet instead of a discrete vortex it turns out that it really doesn't it's not that much different than if you just had a single element um birds obviously don't have traditional vertical tails do they they don't they don't have it at all they don't have engine out problems <laughs> um well, and the outer wing sweep is usually the biggest contributor of course they're dynamically controlling everything um, but with the outer wing swept a bit, which is necessary also for propulsion, so they get an aeroelastic effect that twists the wing naturally without them making muscular effort to make it thrust properly, um, then you also get some yaw stability for free. Uh, plenty of airplanes that are tailless do work just fine. They don't have good Dutch roll damping for humans most of the time. But for a UAV, maybe you don't care too much. You know, Maybe you don't. That's awesome. Thank you. Right. Uh, we're going to try to wrap it up. Any more questions? Okay. We probably take one more question, perhaps. Ron, why don't you have the opportunity to ask the last question? <laughs> if you can unmute yourself, maybe. <laughs> I know he can do um, it. I believe in you, Ron. I know he can do it, Ron. Yeah. If not, right. is, is Jay still here? Jay Gunlich? Let's see. Is Jay still here? There we go. Hey, hi, Mark. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. How's it going, Ron? Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, Mark, one of the things we're looking at is uh, putting a turbo generator inside the aircraft uh, just behind the fuel tank. Um, mm hmm have you been following some of the work on turbo generators that's been going on around the world, in particular the work in China that's gone into the race cars? No, I have to say that I have not. The turbo generator stuff I am familiar with is on Great Horned Owl, but um, I, I am not familiar with what's going on with, the, <laughs> with, with this other stuff. Tell me. Okay, well, I'll have to forward you some links to the Formula E work that um, China has been working on. They have, you know, in full production, and full production, I mean like, like 20,000 units per year, uh, turbo generators in the 20 kilowatt class, and they're working on a smaller. Whoa! Turbo no, really? Uh, big time. So and, these are sustainers for hybrid ground vehicles, but they can be light weighted. And they they nor burn normal uh, 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 diesel or gas uh, gas fuels. They're pretty flexible about what you put in them. Uh, weight turbines typically. No work. kidding. Running. I would love 75,000 RPM. 
I would love to learn more about that. So yeah, just zap me an email on it. And anyone else who's on the team, I'm, you've, it sounds like you've already been talking about it. That's pretty fascinating because with, with the turbo generator and then electric propulsion, you have a lot of ability to, uh, you know, uh, you have just tons of flexibility. You just have tons. And, and uh, somewhere down the road, you could even entertain, you know, making a VTOL version of this thing, right? Um, so with a turbo generator, it just makes it that much easier and then electric motor distribution. Cool. Okay, we'll follow up on that one. That'll be fun. You bet. Okay. Well, it's been great hanging out with you guys today. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, and it, Ron, it's always nice when you interject with something new we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> You've done the research already, and you, you do a great job of finding teams, which, which leads me to just wanting to introduce you to couple of the people from Nepal that are going to be working on the project. Um, let's see, is Sadiq Sadiq still here? He, so he is, hi. yeah. Hi, Sadiq. Um, I know you worked on the blended wing paper. Maybe you could say hi and tell us a little bit about it because um, we're going to be in touch with you a little bit more. I think I'm going to feel a bit embarrassed talking about my blended wing in front of Mark. Looking at it. <laughs> That kind of work does, but yeah, we're basically we're working on uh, very simple uh, UAVs about a meter and a half in span. Um, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, these are also largely student projects. So the paper that Ron noticed was basically students doing um, CFD and stability analysis. Uh, so a lot of the work on XFLR. So that was quite interesting that. You use XFLR as well for mm -hmm. advanced stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, now now we're just trying to work work on open BSP as well. And yeah, we'll, we'll see how uh, we'll, uh, yeah. a, a lot of a, a lot of folks in academics and the students probably don't realize that when they go to Northrop or if they go to um, Chengdu or if they go to Hindustan Aircraft Company, the engineers there are using AVL. <laughs> They're using they're using vehicle sketchpad and using XFLR5. It's and they're automating it and they're writing superscripts that run the stuff automatically. But uh, it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing how this stuff, how democratic it all is. You know, it's it's a world thing. You know, with all this information, you can do amazing things with people around the world. It's wonderful. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. It was fascinating. You bet. And then um, just one of our other partners in Nepal, Prina, um, she is at a different university and um, they have a different group of uh, students that are going to be joining the project. Prina, would you mind saying hi and telling us a little bit about what you guys are doing on your end? I know it's really late for her. She might have fallen asleep. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. hold on. I think Suraj is still on from and Suraj, are you yes. oh, yeah, he's on from ACM. Uh, oh yeah. Hello Mark. Hello Alia. Hello. Uh, nice to uh, meet you, Suraj. Uh, yeah, Pina ma'am and uh, I'm from same university. So uh, we are looking for like uh, AI and control uh, unit side. So um, yeah. I was going to tell uh, one story before I go, and that would be important for you. Uh, my mm -hmm. company, Design, um, we got a contract. Uh, with, we have an A, an artificial intelligence division, <clears throat> and in Washington, D.C. And we got a contract to find wild uh, horses in the desert <laughs> because mm -hmm. on different different states and counties are responsible for counting all the horses or all the rams or all the deer or all the whatever. Uh, they have to report to the state and the wildlife commissions and all this stuff and say, what are the populations doing? And they, and they have to do it. And they hire teams of guys in trucks with cameras, they get UAVs, they go do this. And they did some work with, uh, our guys did some work with artificial intelligence at a, with a real facility and they were asked 
what should we do if we had a if we had five airplanes autonomously looking for these guys what would we do and what they found was really surprising the search path wasn't rational made no sense at all so um uh, and, and what it did was it explored the space in what looked quite random ways, but each time it was learning about watering holes, time of day that animals were showing up at watering holes, time of days that animal, you know, it was just learning, learning that, oh, they go in groups. No, they're always individual. And you just, you don't tell it anything. You just let it learn it. And then the airplanes were adapting their flight path to find them. And then they were finding them. Uh, in the end, they could find, it took one eighth the resources to find all the animals and map them and track them constantly than it would have with a normal grid or other search pattern. But guys, I think I have to scoot and I bet all of you have to scoot too. Oh, yeah, we, we do have to scoot too. <laughs> but thank you so much, Mark. This was awesome. And hopefully everybody learned some really great stuff from Mark today, and then, you know, if, if we run into any kind of uh, questions about specifics, we will definitely be reaching out to you, Mark. So thank you very, All right, very guys. much. Best to Best everybody to all. all around the world. <laughs> yeah. Take care. All right. Thanks, thank Mark. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.